Welcome to another episode of the Distributed Data Show brought to you by Datastax Academy, where we bring you the latest news and interview technical experts to help you succeed in building large-scale distributed systems. Hey, it's Jeff Carpenter. I'm here in the studio with Dwihai Duan. Hello. So once again, we are going to have a super deep dive technical talk which we know our audience loves, get down and dirty with the details here. So today we'd like to talk about Apache Kudu. Yeah. Okay, so first of all, what is Apache Kudu? And then we'll talk about why we're talking about it. So uh, why yet another piece of technology, right? We have a bunch of them already in the big data landscape. The, the idea of Apache Kudu is to offer a, a happy medium between very efficient and fast analytic access pattern, mm -hmm. but also to allow you to have a low latency, random access, and um, random update of your data. And those two contradicting goals, normally do you don't have both of them, but could you offer uh, both of those features? Right. So, I mean, that's one of the great things about this open source world is that if we need, you know, a new technology to fit specific use cases, those databases will get created and then they're in the marketplace. and compete with everything else. So uh, why are we, you know, like we love Cassandra and that's kind of in our wheelhouse and the, what we're used to talking about. Why are we talking about Kudu? Why should we look at that? Well, the, the idea of this show is also to, uh, to talk about big data technologies uh, and you will realize that in fact, uh, all those new, supposedly new technology, they are just reusing known distributed system techniques and also we will learn how to analyze the claims on papers like some they claim something what are the implications when you are reading those claims and okay. also we can make some parallel with apache cassandra because good ideas get reused all the time that's right yeah there there's definitely a set of primitives or uh, architectural constructs that get reused over and over so yeah. yeah this is good to come back and look at our own architectures as well uh, and be able to, like you said, critically evaluate when you're seeing some new fangled thing with which is making all these claims about how great it is. Well, we can read the white papers and really dig into and understand the implications. So you're going to help us do that. So let's start out by why don't you describe for us uh, Apache Kudu at a high level? So at a higher level, first um, let's start the, uh, with the schema. So Kudu offer you a, a strong schema. It means that you can. Uh, they are using a kind of subset of SQL, right? Mm -hmm. So you can have a create table to define your table. You have strongly typed columns, of course. You can define primary keys. And what is interesting uh, is Kudu distinguishes between insert and update. This is not uh, exactly oh, the same. Not thing. like the Cassandra upsert. Model. No, okay. not at all. And in fact, uh, with insert, Kudu does enforce uniqueness constraint. It means, what does it mean? If you are reading the paper, it means that they need to have some kind of read before write. Yeah, how if you are, you know? yeah, yeah, how can you know before writing that uh, the key ex already exists, right? This is mm. the, the, the implication. Uh, so this is for the schema, for writing, it's pretty classical. You just provide the primary key, of course, when you are uh, inserting or updating some piece of data. And for reading, you can read either uh, by primary key with uh, equality. They also offer range query, so you can have inequality on some column of your primary keys. We will get into detail later. And you can also access some of your data on a, by a predicate equality on some columns, which are not uh, part of your primary key. So I think in this case, they are leveraging the columnar format to, uh, okay, to, to be able to skip scrolls very fast. Okay, so yeah, implying maybe a different storage model, which we'll get to. Yeah. But I want to talk about uh, consistency, because this is one of the key differentiating factors between some of these NoSQL databases. So what are the consistency guarantees that Apache Kudu offers? So by default, they say that they, uh, they offer what they call snapshot consistency. So in the, lit in the literature, um, in fact, it, there is nothing called snapshot consistency. Mm -hmm. uh, what we can find in the literature is snapshot isolation. What does it imply? It implies that if you have causally related events, uh, this causality will not be violated. 
right? And how can they in enforce it? Uh, they are using what uh, they call hybrid time, which is a new paper. So they are, they are defining a new protocol to propagate timestamp. We will not get into details. If the, the audience is interested, they can Google for it. And in fact, using this hybrid time, they claim that they can enforce snapshot isolation. Um, contrary to Google Spanner, they, they get inspired by Google Spanner. Oh, okay. They right. do not offer um, external consistency unless, so if you want external consistency, you have to propagate their timestamp, the hybrid time, between servers and clients. So it has a huge implication. Because, okay, propagating the timestamp between servers is easy. You can have a kind of gossip protocol or whatever. Right. But propagating the timestamp between client is much harder because at any time, each client should know, okay, there are two other clients connecting to the cluster, so I need to discuss with them. So this is a right. whole So this has implications sort. for drivers, and Exactly, et you get it. And the last uh, consistency uh, mode they offer is the commit weight. So uh, the idea is very similar to Google Spanner. If you know that there is some maximum bound on the time, storm, the time drift, uh, you can say, okay, before committing each transaction, each uh, batch of insert update, I will wait for this time bound, right? And with Google Spanner, they are using their true time, so they, they have synchronized atomic clock with GPS, so they can reduce the, 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 the time error to seven milliseconds. But if you don't have this specialized hardware, which is the case of anyone here, um, the time bound can be very huge. If you are using NTP, it can be between 100 milliseconds up to one second. So if you are using commit weight, well, it will kill your latency, of course. But it is a trade-off. You have the choice to up into this. Right, okay. So yeah, these are some of the trade-offs that we're gonna observe as clients. Now mm -hmm. let's start talking about what's happening within the cluster uh, in terms of interactions between nodes. Kind of take us inside there. Mm -hmm. So um, first, very similar to many uh, NoSQL database out there, they are splitting their data into shard or partitions. Uh -huh. So they call them tablets. Right. Okay, tablets. Yeah. All right. It is very similar to uh, Cassandra token range. Uh -huh. Same idea. And in fact, they have different roles with the, the machines. There are some machines they are called tablet server. So they, those machines are managing the data. And they have a role which is called master. So the master server is responsible for the catalog. By catalog, uh, they mean the metadata about your schema, right? You are creating a table, you are uh, dropping a table. Uh, the master server also manages the cluster coordination. Okay, adding new uh, machines into the cluster, removing failed nodes, and so on. And it is also responsible for um, tablet repository. So basically, it is equivalent to the, the gossip uh, information we, we carry in Cassandra. So uh, which machine, which tablet server contain which range of data? Okay, so this is not a masterless architecture. This is, no, not at all. This is, um, I would say, a master state, a multi-master. Multi-master, okay. Yeah. Well, let's come back to that. Yeah. Um, they also, um, for the partitioning uh, of data, they reuse some idea from Cassandra. Very, um, so you, you define your primary key. Mm -hmm. Some part of your primary key is used for the distribution of data. So it is equivalent to the Cassandra partition key. Partition right? key, right. And some part of uh, the primary keys is the uh, dedicated for range queries. So oh, I see where this is column, going. Right? Okay. You see that. Clustering columns, yeah. Uh, but uh, so for the, um, the distribution of data, they are using some um, hashing algorithm. I find kind of naive. So the, the idea is to you take those partition columns, you, hash, uh, you take the hash code, and then you uh, you take the modulo of uh, the bucket count. So when you create, uh, you de define your table, you, you say the create table, using, um, uh, you, you define also the number of buckets for your partitioning. Okay. And they are just taking the modulo of uh, the, the hash code, modulo the bucket count. So in my, in my opinion, uh, it is not as distributive as our memory tree hash. 
Okay. Because it's very simple hashing algorithm. And that makes sense. And we do we do allow opinions here yeah. on the distributed data show. So, yeah. so this is my own opinion, <laughs> but uh, people can prove me wrong. No problem. And for oh, one interesting piece of information I, I read from the, the paper is they said for for heavy uh, workload, they recommend between 10 and 100 tablets per machine. And each tablet can be tens of gigabytes. So if you do some math, it means that the density on each tablet server is around one terabyte, two terabyte. So it's so it's is this a practical limit on the s on the size? It's their recommendation. So okay. it's okay, but it's not that huge either, right? I mean, uh, we used to see a uh, density uh, of not of ten or twenty terabytes, you know, when using Apache Parquet. Uh huh. So yeah, one, two, five terabyte is not that huge. Okay. So let's talk now about replication. How does replication work in Kudu? So they, they, they have a, what I call a multi-master master architecture. So you split your data between tablets, mm -hmm. and inside of each tablet, you have uh, some replicas. You know, you define a kind of replication factor, like in Cassandra 3 or 5 or whatever. Okay, so that so part's the same. Yeah, you have three replica, and the, uh, the, the difference with Cassandra is uh, each replica is not equal. You have a, m a kind of master or primary replica. Oh, master and backup replicas. Exactly. Yeah. And in fact, they use the, the Raft uh, consensus protocol uh, to, to reach agreement. So every time uh, a client needs to access a piece of data in this tablet, it has to go through the, the Raft leader for this uh, tablet. And then the rough leader will serialize the operation and then we push it to the other replicas. Okay. So we've been talking about interactions between nodes and how they coordinate. Now let's, let's dive into a s what's happening on a single node and talk about the storage engine and the data format on disk. So uh, since the beginning, when you read the, the abstract of Kudu and uh, the objective of Kudu is to be able to to support a heavy analytics workload, right? And also random updates of the data. It seems contradicting goals. And in fact, there is no magic to be able to, to answer those two contradicting goals. They have uh, a dual, what, what I would call a dual storage engine. So uh, for the data file, they have two notions, the row set and the delta set. So row set is basically a just uh, a format very similar to Apache Parquet, columnar format, right? Very similar. Okay. So you can skip columns very fast. And to accommodate the ability to, uh, to update randomly on the flight some of the data, they also need to keep another data structure they call the delta, delta set, which is, okay, what is the delta between my row set and uh, the current value? And also, you know, always good ideas get reused. They have Bloom filter, right? Uh -huh. And they have primary key index files using B-trees, right? So nothing really new here. Okay, but that is interesting that there is sort of this hybrid storage format with the immutable files and then the delta, the delta files. Exactly. Okay, okay, Jvihai, so let's talk performance. This is where the rubber meets the road, yeah. right? What are the performance characteristics of the common operations like insert, update, select? So for insert, uh, as I said before, because there is a uniqueness constraint, they need a read before write. So, uh, and in fact, the read is uh, n quite complicated. Uh, first, they need to read the Bloom filter to check if uh, it exists. Mm -hmm. And you know that the row uh, exists, and you know that the Bloom filter can give you a uh, uh, wrong positive, right? True negative, but wrong positive. So right. it's not sufficient enough. They also uh, need to read into the partition key index to be absolutely sure that it doesn't exist. So yeah, for insert, for update. So update also need to go through the, the plume filter plus partition key index, why? To get the offset from the row set. So uh, suppose that you have already a, a row in your row set data file the columnar format data file. And when, if you want to update a value, uh, they need to get the offset from the beginning of the file of this row. And then they put 
the, the, the new value of the column plus the offset in the delta phi. That's the trick, right? Okay. So it means that they, they need to go through the whole read pass to fetch the offset before being able to write to the delta phi. And for select, so selects, they, of course, they reuse bloom filter to skip uh, files. Mm -hmm. They reuse par party, uh, primary key index. Uh, they have also other very interesting things which they call interval tree. Um, so it's a kind of interval. And if you give, this is my uh, primary key, it can help you to, to, to skip a lot of bloom filter. So uh, you don't need to read those bloom filter. You can just focus on some subset of the bloom filter. So it gives you a cap about how many bloom filters you need to read for checking. Okay. So with this uh, sort of hybrid or two level storage format that we have, um, we still have these immutable files and mm -hmm. then we have these Delta files. So there's some kind of compaction process that needs to occur, right? Of course, of course, there is no magic. And in fact, there are two kinds of compaction. Uh -huh. You have the, um, the row set compaction, so which is pretty similar to what happened in Cassandra. From time to time, you have a background process that just picks some of them and merge them together. But because you have also the Delta Phi, mm -hmm. you need to compact the Delta Phi back into the row set. Right. So they define some kind of ratio. So if the ratio of my Delta Phi is uh, if the size of my de delta phi is uh, half of the row set, corresponding row set, I need to compact it back to the row set. So yes, I, I think that it creates a kind of uh, right amplification, of course, because now you have two kind of compaction to deal with. Excellent. So uh, this is great analysis, and it's really helpful to us to think critically about you know the systems that we love and work on when we compare them with others and see the good ideas and see what ideas are reused and what new ideas might be coming out. So why don't you wrap this up for us? What's the takeaway? Well, in the takeaway is the the uh, they achieved their happy medium. Okay. I mean, they 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 did their own benchmark and they just uh, show that for uh, real time workload like uh, real time update random access they are not as fast as uh, apache has ba h base mm -hmm. so of course not as fast as cassandra but uh, the big the biggest advantage from h base and cassandra is they are able to provide very fast analytics workload with their columnar storage okay so this is a trade off yeah all right and that's the conclusion all right well thanks a lot to hi thank you jeff all right, join us next time for another episode. See you soon. See you. Thank you for joining us again for the Distributed Data Show. We love your feedback, so go to the Distributed Data Show page on Datastax Academy and tell us what you think. You can also find us on the Datastax Academy YouTube channel or find our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you get great podcasts. While you're there, make sure and subscribe so you don't miss a single episode.